<coughs> we are continuing our study of the book of Proverbs. In our last sermon, we examined the first eight verses of chapter 3. In those eight verses, Solomon told his son about some of the demands and the benefits of God's wisdom. He told his son that God's wisdom will give a man a long and prosperous life. He told his son that God's wisdom demands that we be loving and faithful. They're real demands that spring from God's wisdom, good demands. And finally, he told his son that God's wisdom is far better than man's own wisdom. Now this morning, we're going to examine the next piece of advice that Solomon gave to his son. And that piece of advice was this, son, be generous with God. <laughs> be generous with God. Chapter 3, verses 9 through 10. Honor the Lord with your wealth and with the first fruits of all your crops. Then your barns will be filled to overflowing and your vats will brim over with new wine. The command to be generous with God is not new information for any of us. Preachers have been telling us this for years. They've been telling us for years that God wants us to be generous with him and that if we're generous with him, he will be generous with us. Now sometimes <clears throat> preachers give us this message for good reasons. Sometimes preachers give us this message for their own selfish reasons. But whatever the reason, it's a message we've all heard. Unfortunately, it's a message that is often abused. Too often we're told that this passage in Proverbs and others like it are guarantees that God <clears throat> will give lots of money to those who give lots of money to him. This is not true. Let me just set that on the front end. This is not true. And shame on those men and women who teach this stuff. Now, having said that, there's no question but that God does reward those who are generous in their giving by giving them greater wealth. But not always. Sometimes he does, sometimes he does not. As we pointed out in several of our earlier sermons, the statement about God giving wealth to those who give their wealth to him is a generalization, not a universal. That is, it is a statement that is generally true. But there are some exceptions. Now having said that, it's important to note that the really important issue Solomon was trying to teach his son in this passage of Scripture was that he needed to be generous with God. And by extension that we all, all of us need to be generous with God. Now, when you are generous with God, God may reward your generosity by giving you wealth in return, or he may not. But one thing we can be certain of, if we are generous with God, he will be generous with us. us. His generosity to us may not be financial, because there are other ways in which God can reward our generosity by being generous with us. There are many other ways that he can fill our barns to overflowing when we are generous with him. Honor the Lord with your wealth and with the first fruits of all your crops. Then your barns will be filled to overflowing and your vats will brim over with new wine. And because this passage of Scripture speaks about honoring God with our wealth, we're going to spend two Sunday mornings talking about the importance of this subject. And we're going to begin by examining five principles that should guide our giving. Five principles that should guide our giving. Principle number one, <clears throat> giving is not a matter of the law. It is not a matter of the law. It's important to note at the very beginning of this message on giving that there is no command in the New Testament to give a tenth. There's no command there to give a tenth. The command to give God a tenth is the command God gave Israel at Mount Sinai. We read about it in Leviticus chapter 27, a tithe. Now, the word tithe means a tenth. So a tithe or a tenth of everything, God said, from, excuse me, a tithe of everything from the land, whether grain, 
from the soil or fruit from the trees belongs to the Lord. It is holy to the Lord. Now this command to give a tenth was given to Israel, not the church. This doesn't mean, however, that we should dismiss it as being unimportant. The laws God gave to Israel at Mount Sinai were important, and they are still important. In fact, many of the commands that were given at Mount Sinai have been repeated in the New Testament, and all serious Christians know that we are expected to keep the New Testament commands. God did not, however, repeat the command that we give him a tenth of our income. He did not repeat that command. So to declare that it's a New Testament command is simply not true. Actually, the commands God gives in the New Testament are more demanding. The New Testament position is that the man or woman of God who is tr truly committed to him will give Christ everything. That's, that, by the way, for you who are mathematically challenged, is more than 10%. <laughs> the New Testament position is that the man or woman of God who is truly committed to Christ will commit his or her entire life to Christ. The New Testament position is that the man or woman of God who is truly committed to God and his kingdom gives him everything. The truly committed Christian gives his or her time and talent and treasure, all of it. Paul put it this way in Romans 12. Therefore, I urge you, Brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. In other words, take your whole body, your whole self, your whole everything, and put it on the altar as a sacrifice to God. Burn up your life for Christ. That's the New Testament command. That's bigger than 10%. In Philippians, Paul put it very simply and beautifully. For me to live is Christ, to die is gain. All of life is Christ. The New Testament position on giving <clears throat> is that we give Christ our entire life. At this point in the sermon, some of you are probably a saying to yourselves, if we're not commanded to give God a tenth of our income, why have we been told for so many years that we're supposed to give a tenth? And the reason is this. Most preachers and teachers teach that we should give a tenth not because it is a New Testament command, but because it is a spiritual principle that serves as a guideline for giving. And this principle was laid down in Scripture hundreds of years before God gave this law to Israel at Mount Sinai. Both Abraham and Jacob gave God a tenth of their income, and they lived hundreds of years before God gave the law to Israel. Abraham gave a tenth, Jacob gave a tenth, and God expected the Israelites to give a tenth, so it's a very good principle. Now, an interesting aspect of the tenth God expected from the Israelites is that God did not think of that tenth as ever having really belonged to the individual Israelite. He never viewed it as actually ever belonging to them. God viewed it as being God's from the very beginning. So for an Israelite to fail to give God the tenth was to, in effect, steal from God. Because that tenth wasn't theirs. And if they don't give it back, that's stealing. This is why God inspired Malachi to write, Will a man rob God, yet you rob me? But you ask, how do we rob you? In tithes and offerings, that's his answer. You are under a curse, the whole nation of you, because you are robbing me. Bring the whole tithe, that is the tenth, into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that you will not have room enough for it. People love that. <laughs> it's a way to get more, right? Wrong attitude. For the Christian then, giving God a tenth is not demanded. It is, however, a good guideline for giving, and we are commanded to give God from our income. There's no question that's a New Testament command. On the 1 Corinthians chapter 16, on the first day of every week, each one of you should set aside a sum of money in keeping with his income, saving it up so that when I come, Paul wrote, 
So when I come, no collection will have to be made. From the Old Testament, then, we're given two important principles for giving. The first principle is that 10% is a good guideline. The second principle is that failing to give to God is stealing from God. You say, that's a little harsh. Take it up with God. I'm just passing the word on. And you really don't want to steal from God. When God entrusts us with wealth, he expects us to give a portion of that wealth to the work that he wants supported here on earth. So when we fail to give a portion back to him, we're stealing from God. And stealing from God is really not a good thing to do. I think you all would agree with that. Principle number two. Giving is not a matter of the bank account. Giving is not a matter of the bank account, or to put it another way, God does not expect the rich to be the ones who finance his work on earth. There's a delusion that's been part of the thinking of far too many Christians, and that delusion is this. The real support for the work of building the kingdom of God will come from the wealthy. The wealthy will see to it that our churches are built and maintained. The wealthy will see to it that Bible colleges are built and financed. The wealthy will see to it that mission organizations have the money they need. But these things are not so. It is a delusion to believe that God expects the wealthy to finance the building of his kingdom here on earth. If the building of the kingdom of God was dependent on the donation of the wealthy, there would be no kingdom of God on earth. Now, I'm not suggesting that there are not wealthy Christians who are generous, because there are. I've known a number of wealthy Christians who are wonderfully generous in supporting the work of God. But the bulk of the money used in the work of building the kingdom of God comes from ordinary and even poor Christians, which is a good thing, because most churches don't have a whole lot of wealthy people. Unfortunately, even many of the ordinary and poor Christians are not as generous as they should be. Just as there is a delusion that the support for building the kingdom of God will come primarily from the wealthy, there is a delusion among the not-so-wealthy and poor that since they are not wealthy, they're not expected to give very much. But they often assure us, if they ever do get a lot of money, they'll start giving. <laughs> <laughs> don't believe it folks don't believe it the truth is this this is painful but it's true a person who is stingy when he is poor will be stingy when he is rich being stingy is a matter of character not finance it's really the truth it's easy for a man to say that if he suddenly gets a million dollars, he'll get half of, give half of it to God. It's easy for a man to say this because he'll probably never get a million dollars, so there's no, no way we'll ever call him on that promise. Let me illustrate. The story of a pastor who visited a farmer who was a member of his congregation. He asked the farmer that if he had a million dollars, would he give half of it to the church? Oh, yes, I absolutely would, pastor. The pastor then asked, if he had a thousand sheep, would he give half of them to the church? Of course I would, Pastor. Of course I would. Well, what if you had ten horses, asked the pastor. Would you give five of them to the church? Absolutely. Well, then, said the pastor, what if you had two pigs? Would you give half of them to the church? Uh oh, Pastor, you're going too far. I have two pigs. That sort of says it all, doesn't it? I'll give, I'll give half or more of my imaginary wealth, but don't start touching the real stuff. Concerning wealth, <clears throat> the issue is not how much I have. The issue is what am I doing with what I have. One man wrote, it is not what you do with a million if riches should be your lot. It is what you are doing at the present with the dime or quarter you've got. Burn that in your brain, folks. Burn it in the brain. If you're waiting until you get rich to be generous with God, 
You'll never be generous with God. Principle number one, giving is not a matter of the law. Principle number two, giving is not, is not a matter of the bank account. Excuse me, I'm still a little dry. Principle number three, <clears throat> giving is a matter of the heart. Giving is a matter of the heart. 2 Corinthians 9, each man should give what he has decided in his heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. I love that passage. God expects our giving to come from hearts that are filled with real love for God and a real appreciation for all that he has done for us. A heart that is filled with a real love for God and a real appreciation for all that he has done is a heart that delights in giving and delights in being generous. This is the standard by which we should give. And this was a standard that was exhibited by so many first century Christians. Paul wrote about one of those groups, a church at Macedonia. He wrote, and now, brothers, we want you to know about the grace that God has given the Macedonian churches. Out of the most severe trial, their overflowing joy and their extreme poverty welled up in rich generosity. For I testify that they gave as much as they were able and even beyond their ability, <clears throat> entirely on their own. They urgently pleaded with us for the privilege of sharing in this service to the saints. That's the attitude we should have. These Christians in Macedonia were undergoing severe persecution. They were living in extreme poverty, yet they felt compelled to be generous because their hearts were filled to overflowing with love and appreciation for all that God had done. And when men and women have hearts like that, their giving is not only generous, their giving will be sacrificial, which brings us to the fourth principle in giving. Giving is best. Giving is best when it's sacrificial. Sacrificial giving is giving more. Sometimes I don't follow this well. Giving is best when it's our sacrificial giving is giving more than you can afford, but doing it anyway, because God is so great and you love him and his children. Sacrificial giving is giving even when it hurts, but doing it anyway, because God is so awesome and his children are so precious. Aren't they precious? Absolutely. Sacrificial giving is not based on whether or not you can afford to give or whether or not it is comfortable to give. Sacrificial giving is often uncomfortable and unaffordable and even painful, but it's the right thing to do. Sacrificial giving springs from a heart that is filled with love for God and a love for God's family. Sacrificial giving is biblical giving. Sacrificial giving is biblical giving. King David understood this about giving when he wrote, I will not sacrifice to the Lord my God burnt offerings that cost me nothing. Jesus understood sacrificial giving when he promised, when he pointed to the tremendous sacrifice the widow made when she gave everything she had to God. Passage all of you are familiar with, but every so often you need to be reminded Jesus sat down opposite the place where the offerings were put and watched the crowd putting their money into the temple treasury. Many rich people threw in large amounts. But a poor widow came and put in two very small copper coins worth only a fraction of a penny. Calling his disciples to him, Jesus said, I tell you the truth, this poor widow has put more into the treasury than all the others. They all gave out of their wealth, but she, out of her poverty, put in everything, everything she had to live on. 
This, to the best of my knowledge, is the only time Jesus pointed to anyone's giving in the New Testament. And it wasn't to someone who put in a million dollars or $500,000 or even $100, but someone who put in a fraction of a penny. So how important is giving the fraction of a penny if that's all you have? I'll let you rest on that. If this widow's giving had not been recorded in Scripture and if it had not been complimented by Jesus, many Christians would have criticized her criticized her from being imprudent and terribly impractical. <laughs> Why in the world, they would say, did she give everything she had to God? God doesn't need her money. She needs her money. She shouldn't have done it. It was impractical. It was imprudent. I want to let you folks in on something. That should be obvious. God doesn't need anyone's money. He doesn't need anyone's money. He owns the whole universe. If that was not enough, next tomorrow morning he would just get up and create a dozen others. He doesn't need your money. The issue at hand is not what God needs. The issue at hand is what we need. And we need to give. We desperately need to give. Which leads to our fifth and last principle. Giving is a blessing. It is a blessing to give. When God created us, he created us in his own image. He created us to be like himself in a number of ways. And one of the ways in which we are like God is that, like God, we are created to be givers because God is a giver. And to be blessed with pleasure when we give. Now, it's easy to see this demonstrate in the lives of believers and non-believers alike. For example, every time there's a disaster, men and women immediately give their time and their energy and their money to help those who are suffering. You see it all the time. Anytime there's a hurricane or earthquake, people just join in and help. And when they're interviewed by the press, these givers invariably say, it made me feel good to give. It made me, now there should be some other reasons for giving. That always bothers me is a little bit. But it makes them feel good. You know why it makes them feel good? Because God created us to be givers and to receive pleasure when we give. Proverbs 22. A generous man will himself be what? Bless. Feeling good is a blessing, isn't it? Who's ever put down feeling good? <laughs> Every time I feel good, I feel blessed. A generous man will himself be blessed for he shares his food with the poor. Acts 20. In everything I did, I showed you that by this kind of hard work, we must help the weak. Remembering the words the Lord Jesus himself said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. God created us to be givers and receive pleasure when we give. We're blessed when we give. Unfortunately, sin has corrupted the human race to such an extent that we're not nearly as generous as we should be. And when we fail to be generous... As generous as we should be, we fail to be as blessed as we might have been blessed. For the, Christ, for the Christian, there's even more reason to be generous. Not only are there the inherent blessings that come from generosity, that is the blessing of feeling good about giving, God has also promised to be generous to the Christian who is generous. And Luke 6 Jesus said, give, and it will be given to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over, will be poured into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. In other words, God promises that if you are generous with him, he will be generous with you. 2 Corinthians 9. Remember this, whoever sows sparingly, will also reap sparingly. Whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Proverbs 11, a generous man will prosper. He who refreshes others will himself be refreshed. Malachi 3, bring the whole tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven 
and pour out so much blessing that you will not have room enough for it. We could go on and on and on. The scriptures are filled with passages just like this. In these few verses, God is saying in effect, I love generosity so much that I will be especially generous to those who are generous. And if you fail to be generous, God will not be as generous with you, especially in those matters that count the most. And we're not talking about money because money is not the matter that counts the most. If you're generous, I will be generous with you. Jesus expressed it this way, a very powerful passage of Scripture. Whoever can be trusted with very little can also be trusted with very much. On the other hand, if you have not been trustworthy in handling worldly wealth, who will trust you with true riches? What Jesus was getting at was this. If I can't trust you with a little bit worldly wealth, I'm not going to trust you with a lot. If I can't trust you with worldly wealth, I'm not going to trust you with spiritual wealth. Perhaps the reason you have a diminished or non-existent spiritual ministry is because you have failed with your financial ministry. The message from God is clear. If I can't trust you with the little things, like worldly wealth, then I can't trust you with big things, like the kingdom of God. If I can't trust you with money, I can't trust you with souls. Fairly clear, isn't it? If I can't trust you with little things like money, forget it, folks. I'm not going to trust you with souls. You're not up to the task. The issue of giving God your treasure is not now or has it ever been a matter of what God needs because God needs nothing. We are the ones in need. We are the ones who are in desperate need of giving to God. All of which means that if you are not giving to God and giving generously, you're the loser. God's not losing a thing, but you are. Why would you want to be a loser? Maybe some people are masochistic and want to be. I've never really been into losing. The message is very clear. He doesn't need your money. You need to give. You need to be blessed. You want God to be generous with you and get off the money thing. Give to get. That's just hokum for TV guys who are trying to raise money for themselves. They're dishonest, folks. Ignore those guys. In fact, it's blasphemous what they teach. Your generosity to God should come from a heart that loves him and appreciates him, loves the saints, a heart that wants to help the saints. And God says such an attitude as that. It's the attitude I esteem, and I will favor you and be generous. Not necessarily by giving you more money, but I will be generous. There are lots of ways God can be generous with us beyond giving us money. In fact, the great treasures in life are not money. You want a great ministry? God is saying, if I can't trust you with the little stuff, I'm not going to trust you with the important stuff. Father, we love you. We worship you. We thank you for loving us and giving us the privilege of being part of building your kingdom. I pray that we'll all take that to heart and roll up our sleeves and do it. I pray to the Lord that you'll give us all a good week. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.